Volume One, Chapter Sixteen of The Day Will Come by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Sixteen. Be useful where thou livest, that they may both want and wish thy pleasing presence still. All worldly joys go less to the one joy of doing kindnesses. What impression did the man make upon you in that brief meeting? asked Theodore. Did he strike you as a roué? no that was the odd part of the business he had the steady respectable air of a breadwinner a professional or perhaps a commercial man i could not tell which there was nothing flashy or dissipated in his appearance he looked me steadily in the face when he bowed to me at parting and he had a frank straightforward expression and a grave decision of manner that was not without dignity he was soberly dressed in a style that attracted no attention i had no doubt that he was a gentleman he was handsome you say yes he was decidedly handsome but i can remember only the general character of his face not features or details for i saw him only twice in my life ah you saw him again once again some years later after her death she is dead then cried theodore that is the fact i am most anxious to learn from a reliable source of information there was a rumour of her death years ago but no one could give me any evidence of the fact i went to boulogne last week to try and trace her to her last resting-place but i could discover neither tombstone nor record of any kind and yet it was at boulogne she died i will tell you all i know about her if you like it doesn't amount to much pray tell me everything you can i am deeply grateful to you for having treated me with so much frankness it was on her account i received you i am glad to talk to any one who is interested in her pitiful fate there were so few to care for her i think there is no lot more sad than that of a broken-down gentleman's daughter born to an inheritance she is never to enjoy brought up to think of herself as a personage with a right to the world's respect and finding herself friendless and penniless in the bloom of her womanhood exposed to the world's contumely theodore's face flushed a little at this mention of his interest in the unhappy lady for he could but feel that the interest was of a sinister kind but he held his peace and miss newton went on with her story it was ever so many years after that meeting in richmond park i think it must have been nearly ten years when i ran against that very man upon a windy march day in folkestone i had thought much and often of my poor girl in all those years wondering how the world had used her and whether the lover whom she trusted so implicitly had been true to her i shuddered at the thought of what her fate might have been if he were false i had never heard a word about her in all that time i had seen no report of a divorce suit in the papers i knew absolutely nothing of her history from the hour i parted with her in thompson's seat till i ran against that man in folkestone i am rather shy about speaking to strangers in a general way but i was so anxious to know her fate that i stopped this man whose very name was unknown to me and asked him to tell me about my poor friend he looked bewildered as well he might at being pounced upon in that manner i explained that i was evelyn strangway's old governess and that i was uneasy at having lost sight of her for so many years and was very anxious to see her again he looked troubled at my question and he answered me gravely i am sorry to say you will never do that your friend is dead i asked when she died and where he told me within the last month and at boulogne i asked if he was with her at the last and he said no and then he lifted his hat and muttered something about having very little time to get to the station he was going to london by the next train it seemed and he was evidently anxious to shake me off but i was determined he should answer at least one more question was her husband with her when she died i asked his face darkened at the question which i suppose was a foolish one do you think it likely he said trying to move past me but i laid my hand upon his sleeve in my eagerness pray tell me that her end was not unhappy and that she was penitent for her sins he looked very angry at this if i stand here talking to you another minute i shall lose my train madam he said and i have important business in london this afternoon a fly came strolling by at this moment he hailed it and jumped in and he drove off into what thomas carlyle would call the immensities i never saw him again i never knew his name or calling or place of abode or anything about him 
i can no more localize him than i can goethe's mephistopheles god knows how he treated my poor girl whether he was kind or cruel whether he was faithful to a dishonourable tie or whether he held it as lightly as such ties have been held by the majority of men from abraham downwards the little woman's face flushed and her eyes filled as she gave vent to her feelings and this is all you know of evelyn strangway said theodore when she had finished this is all i know of her and now tell me why you are so anxious to learn her history you who can never have seen her face except in the picture at cheriton i dressed her for that picture and sat by while it was painted i will tell you the motive of my curiosity answered theodore you have treated me so frankly that i feel i must not withhold my confidence from you i know that i can rely upon your discretion i can talk as you have just heard said miss newton but i can be as silent as the grave when i like you must have read something about the murder at cheriton last july i read a great deal about it i took a morbid interest in the case knowing the house so well in every cranny and corner i could picture the scene as vividly as if i had seen the murdered man lying there a most inexplicable murder apparently motiveless apparently motiveless that fact has so preyed upon the widow's mind that she has imagined a motive she has a strange fancy that one of the strangways must have been the author of the crime she has brooded over their images till her whole mind has become possessed with the idea of one of that banished race garnering his wrath for long years until at last the hour came for a bloody revenge and then striking a death-blow out of the dark striking his fatal blow and vanishing from the sight of men as if a phantom arm had been stretched out of the night to deal that blow she has asked me to help her in discovering the murderer and i am pledged to do my utmost towards that end i am the more anxious to do so as i tremble for the consequences if she should be allowed to brood long upon this morbid fancy about the strangways i think however that with your help i have now laid that ghost i have traced the two brothers to their graves and i suppose we may accept the statement of the man you met at folkestone as sufficient evidence of mrs darcy's death especially as it seems to fit in with the account of the then vicar of cheriton who met her in boulogne in the summer of sixty four looking very ill and much aged it was in the spring of sixty five i met that man at folkestone i could find the exact date in my diary if you wish to be very precise about it for it is one of my old maidish ways to be very regular in keeping my diary poor evelyn to think that any one should be mad enough to suspect her of being capable of murder or fred or reginald they had the strangway temper all three of them and a fiery temper it was when it was roused a temper that led to family quarrels and all sorts of unhappiness but murder is a different kind of thing that is the question said theodore gravely is there such a wide gulf between the temper that makes family quarrels sets father against son and brother against brother and the temper that pulls a trigger or uses a bowie knife i thought they were one and the same thing in actual quality and that the result was dependent upon circumstances oh don't talk like that please murder is something exceptional a hideous solecism in nature and in this case why murder what had sir godfrey carmichael done that any member of the strangway family should want to kill him i tell you that the idea is a wild one the morbid growth of my cousin's sorrow of course it is i am very sorry for her poor soul i don't suppose any woman could suffer more than she must have suffered it is a dreadful story and she was very fond of her husband i dare say she adored him they had been lovers almost from her childhood there never were a more devoted bride and bridegroom their honeymoon was not even beginning to wane they were still lovers still in a state of sweet surprise at finding themselves husband and wife poor girl i saw her the day before the murder a brilliant creature the very spirit of joy i saw her the morning after a spectre with awful eyes and marble face more dreadful to look upon than her murdered husband it is all too sad sighed miss newton i begin to think that cheriton is a fatal house and that no one can be happy there however you can tell this poor lady that the strangways are exonerated from any part in her misery i shall write to her to-night to that effect 
and now miss newton let me thank you once more for your friendly frankness and wish you good-night don't be in such a hurry mr dalbrook i like your face and i should like to see you again some day if you can find time to waste an hour upon an old maid in such a god-forsaken place as wedgwood street i shall think an hour so spent most delightfully employed answered theodore who was quite subjugated by the charm of this little person and her surroundings he did not remember having ever sat in a room he liked better than this first-floor front in wedgwood street with its terra-cotta walls prettily bound books curious oddments of old china and comfortable curtains of creamy workhouse sheeting with a bold vermilion border worked by sarah newton's indefatigable fingers i should very much like to hear all about your life in this strange neighbourhood he said there is not much to tell when my little fortune left by my uncle the dry salter fell in to me i was a lonely old woman without one surviving relative for whom i cared twopence i was pretty tired of teaching french and german god knows how many hundred times i must have gone through ollendorf in both languages and i've done him a good many times in italian par de sur marche perhaps i might have held on for a year or two longer as i was very fond of those nice girls and boys at kettisford vicarage if it hadn't been for ollendorf he decided me leela the youngest girl had only just begun that accursed book she was blundering over the baker's golden candlestick the very morning i got the lawyer's letter to tell me of my uncle's death and the will and the legacy i snatched the book out of her hand and shut it with a bang ain't i to do any more ollendorf sally she asked you may do as much as you like my love i said but you'll do no more with me i'm a millionaire or at least i feel as rich and independent as if i were a rothschild well i lay awake all that night making plans for my life and trying to think out how i could get the most comfort out of my little fortune enjoy my declining years have everything i wanted and yet be of some use to my fellow-creatures and the end of it was that i made up my mind to take a roomy lodging in a poor neighbourhood where i should not be tempted to spend a penny upon appearances furnish it after my own heart and make myself happy in just my own way without caring a straw what anybody thought about me i knew that i was plain as well as elderly that i could never be admired or cut a figure in the genteel world so i determined to renounce the gentilities altogether and to be looked up to in a little world of my own and you have found your plan answer it has answered beyond my hopes ever since i was thirty years of age and had finished with all young ideas and daydreams i had one particular ideal of earthly bliss and that was the position of a country squire's wife an energetic active well-meaning woman the central figure in a rural village having her model cottages and her allotment gardens her infirmary her mission-house the good genius of her little community a queen in miniature and without political entanglements or menace of foreign war now it could never be my lot to reign on a landed estate to build cottages or cut up fertile meadows for cottagers gardens but i thought by taking up my abode in a poor neighbourhood and visiting in a friendly familiar way no tracts or preachings among the most respectable of the inhabitants and slowly feeling my way among the difficult subjects i might gradually acquire an influence just as strong as that of the lady bountiful in a country parish and might come to be as useful in my small way as the squire's wife with her larger means and i have done it added miss newton triumphantly there are rooms in this street and in other streets that are to be my model cottages there are overworked underfed women who look up to me as their providence there are children who come and hang to my skirts as i pass along the streets there are great hulking men who ask my advice and get me to write their letters for them what could a squire's wife have more than that and yet i have only a hundred and fifty pounds a year to spend upon my people you give them something more than money you give them sympathy the magnetism of your strong and generous nature ah there is something in that magnetism is a good word there must be some reason why people attach themselves so ardently to mr gladstone don't you know some charm in him that holds them almost in spite of themselves and makes them think as he thinks and veer as he veers yes they swing round with him like the boats going round with the tide and they can't help it any more than the boats can and i think to compare small things with great there must be some touch of that magnetic power in me 
concluded miss newton i am sure of it said theodore and i am sure too that you must be like a spot of light in this dark little world of yours i live among my friends that is the point explained miss newton i don't come from belgravia or from a fashionable terrace in kensington and tell them they ought to keep their wretched rooms cleaner and open their windows and put flower-pots on their window-sills i live here and they can come and see how i keep my rooms and judge for themselves their landlord is my landlord and a nice life i lead him about water and whitewash and drains he is thoroughly afraid of me i am happy to say and generally bolts round a corner when he sees me in the street but i am too quick for his overfed legs i tackle him about all his shortcomings and he finds it easier to spend a few pounds upon his property now and then than to have me upon his heels at every turn so now crook's tenements have quite a reputation in lambeth if you were to see the old dragon you would wonder at my pluck in attacking him i can assure you your whole life is wonderful to me miss newton and i only wish there were hundreds of women in this big city living just as you live tell me please what kind of people your neighbours are oh they are people of all kinds some of course who are quite impracticable for whom i can do nothing but there are many more who are glad of my friendship and who receive me with open arms the single women and widows are my chief friends and some of those i know as well as if we had been brought up and educated upon the same social level they are workwomen of all kinds tailoresses shirt-makers girls who work for military outfitters extra hands for court dressmakers shop-girls at the humbler class of shops shoe-binders artificial flower-makers i wonder whether you would like to see some of them i should like it very much indeed then perhaps you will come to one of my tea-parties i give two tea-parties a week all the winter to just as many of my women friends as this room will hold it holds about twenty very comfortably so i make twenty-five the outside limit we rather enjoy a little bit of a crush and i give my invitations so that they all have such pleasure as i can give them fairly turn and turn about we do not begin our evening too early for the working hours are precious to my poor things we take tea at eight o'clock and we seldom separate before half-past eleven just as if we were at a theatre we have a little music a little reading and recitation and sometimes a round game at cards when we are in a wild humour we play dumb crambo or even puss in the corner and we have always a great deal of talk we sit round this fireplace in a double semicircle the younger ones sitting on the rug in front of us elders and we talk and talk and talk about ourselves mostly and you can't think what good it does us surely god gave man speech as the universal safety valve it lets off half our troubles and half our sense of the world's injustice please let me come to your very next party said theodore smiling at the little woman's ardour that will be to-morrow evening replied miss newton i shall have to make an excuse for your appearance as we very seldom invite a man you will have to read or recite something as a reason for your being asked don't you know i will not recoil even from that test i have distinguished myself occasionally at a penny reading am i to be tragic or comic be both if you can we like to laugh but we revel in something that makes us cry desperately if you could give us something creepy into the bargain freeze our blood with a ghost or two it would be all the more enjoyable i will satiate you with my talents i shall feel like pentheus when he intruded upon his mother and her crew and shall be humbly grateful for not being torn to pieces morally in the way of criticism good night and a thousand thanks wait said miss newton i'm afraid it is much foggier than when you came i have smelt the fog coming on while we've been talking wouldn't you like a cab i should very much but i doubt if i shall succeed in finding one you wouldn't but i dare say i can get you one replied miss newton decisively she had an unobtrusive little chatelaine at her side and from the bunch of implements scissors penknife thimble she selected a small whistle then she pulled back one of the cream white curtains opened the window and whistled loud and shrill into the fog two minutes afterwards there came a small treble voice out of the darkness what is it miss newton who's that tommy meadows all right tommy do you think you could find a hansom without getting yourself run over rather 
do you want it bring to your door miss if you please tommy i'm off cried the shrill voice and in less than ten minutes a two-wheeler rattled along the street and drew up sharply at tommy's treble command with tommy himself seated inside enjoying the drive and the uncertainty of the driver his spirits were still further exalted by the gift of a sixpence from theodore as he stepped into the cab to be taken back to the temple at a foot-pace even that sitting-room of his which he had taken pains to make comfortable and homelike had a gloomy look after that bright room in lambeth with its terracotta walls and cream-coloured curtains its gaily bound books and vivid valoris vases perched in every available corner he was more interested in that quaint interior and in the woman who had created it than he had been in any one except that one woman who filled the chief place in all his thoughts the vicar of kettisford had not overestimated sarah newton's power of fascination he was in wedgwood street at a few minutes before eight on the following evening the sky above lambeth was no longer obscured there were wintry stars shining over that forest of chimney-pots and everlasting monotony of slated roofs and even lambeth looked lively with its costers barrows and bustle of eventide marketing theodore found the door open as it had been yesterday and he found an extra lamp upon the first-floor landing and the door of miss newton's room ajar while from within came the sound of many voices moderated to a subdued tone but still lively his modest knock was answered by miss newton herself who was standing close to the door ready to greet every fresh arrival how do you do we are nearly all here she said cheerily i hope you have not just been dining for with us tea means a hearty meal and if you can't eat anything we shall feel as if we were a banco's ghost how do you do mrs kirby to another arrival baby better i hope yes that's right how are you clara and you rose you've had that wretched tooth out i can see it in your face such a relief isn't it so glad to see you susan dale and you maria and you jenny why we are all here i do believe yes miss newton said a bright-looking girl by the fireplace who had been making toast indefatigably for twenty minutes and whose complexion had suffered accordingly there are two-and-twenty of us four-and-twenty counting the gentlemen and you i think that's as many as you expected yes everybody's here so we may as well begin tea in most such assemblies where the intention was to benefit a humble class of guests the proceedings would have begun with a hymn but at miss newton's parties there were neither hymns nor prayers and yet miss newton loved her hymn-book and delighted in the pathos and the sweetness of the music with which those familiar words are interwoven nor would she yield to anybody in her belief in the efficacy of prayer but she had made up her mind from the beginning that her tea-parties were to be pure and simple recreation and that any good which should come out of them was to come incidentally the women and girls who came at her bidding were to feel they came to be entertained came as her guests just as had they been duchesses they might have gone to visit other duchesses in park lane or carlton gardens they were not asked in order that they should be taught or preached to or wheedled into the praying of prayers or the singing of hymns they went as equals to visit a friend who relished their society and did not everybody relish the tea which might be described as a yorkshire tea of a humble order not the yorkshire tea which may mean mayonnaise and perigord pie chicken and champagne but tea as understood in the potteries of hull or the humbler alleys and streets of leeds or bradford three moderate-sized tables have been put together to make one capacious board spread with snowy damask upon which appeared two large plum loaves two tall towers of bread and butter a glass bowl of marmalade a bowl of jam two dishes of thinly sliced german sausage set off with sprigs of parsley german sausage bought at the most respectable ham and beef shop in the borough and as trustworthy as german sausage can be and for crowning glory of the feast a plentiful supply of shrimps freshly boiled savouring of the unseen sea the hot buttered toast was frizzling on a brass footman in front of the fire ready to be handed round piping hot as required there were two tea-trays one at each end of the table and there were two bright copper kettles which had never been defiled by the smoke of the fire filled with admirable tea miss newton took her place at the head of the table with theodore on her right hand and a pale and fragile-looking young woman on her left these two assisted the hostess in the administration of the tea-tray handing cups and saucers sugar-basin and cream jug and in so doing they had frequent occasion to look at each other 
having gone there prepared to be interested theodore soon began to interest himself in this young woman whom miss newton addressed as marian she was by no means beautiful now but theodore fancied that she had once been very handsome and he occupied himself in reconstructing the beauty of the past from the wreck of the present the lines of the face were classic in their regularity but the hollow cheeks and pallid complexion told of care and toil and the face was aged untimely by a hard and joyless life the eyes were darkest grey large and pathetic-looking the eyes of a woman who had suffered much and thought much the beauty of those eyes gave a mournful charm to the pale pinched face and the light auburn hair was still luxuriant theodore noted the delicate hands and taper fingers which differed curiously from the hands which were busy around the hospitable board he could see that this young woman was a favourite with sarah newton and he told himself that she was of a race apart from the rest but he was agreeably surprised in finding that except for the prevailing cockney accent and a few slight lapses in grammar and pronunciation miss newton's guests were quite as refined as those ladies of dorchester with whom it had been his privilege to associate indeed he was not sure that he did not prefer the cockney twang and the faulty grammar to the second-hand smartness and slang of the young ladies whose awfully jolly ate it and don't you know had so often irritated his ear on tennis lawn or at afternoon tea here at least there was the unstudied speech of people who knew not the caprices of fashion or the latest catchword that had descended from belgravia to brompton and from brompton to the provinces there was a great deal of talk as miss newton had told him there would be and as she encouraged all her guests to talk about themselves he gathered a good deal of interesting information about the state of the different trades and the ways and manners of various employers most of whom seemed to be of a despotic and grasping temper the widows talked of their children's ailments or their progress at the board school the girls talked a little with all modesty of their sweethearts sarah newton was interested in every detail of those humble lives and seemed to remember every fact bearing upon the joys or the sorrows of her guests it was a wonder to theodore to see how the careworn faces lighted up round the cheerful table in the lamplight yes it was surely a good thing to live among these daughters of toil and to lighten their burdens by this quick sympathy this cheerful hospitality vast pleasure-halls and people's palaces may do much for the million but here is one little spinster with her small income making an atmosphere of friendliness and comfort for the few and able to get a great deal nearer to them than philanthropy on a gigantic scale can ever get to the many theodore noticed that while most other tongues babbled freely the girl called marian sat silent after her task of distributing the tea was over with hands folded in her lap listening to the voices round her and with a soft slow smile lighting her face now and then in repose her countenance was deeply sad and he found himself speculating upon the history that had left those melancholy lines upon a face that was still young i am much interested in your next neighbour he said to miss newton presently while marian was helping another girl to clear the table i feel sure there must be something very sad in her experience of life and that she has sunk from a higher level so do i answered miss newton but i know very little more about her than you do except that she is a most exquisite worker with those taper fingers of hers and that she has worked for the same baby linen house for the last three years and has lived in the same second floor back in hercules buildings i think she is as fond of me as she can be yet she has never told me where she was born or who her people were or what her life has been like once she went so far as to tell me that it had been a very commonplace life and that her troubles have been in no wise extraordinary except the fact of her having had a very severe attack of typhus fever which left her a wreck once from some chance allusion i learnt that it was in italy she caught the fever and that it was badly treated by a foreign doctor but that one fact is all she ever let slip in her talk so carefully does she avoid every mention of the past i need hardly tell you that i have never questioned her i have reason to know that her life for the last three years has been spotless an industrious temperate christian life and that she is charitable and kind to those who are poorer than herself that is quite enough for me and i have encouraged her to make a friend of me in every way in my power she is happy in having found such a friend an invaluable friend to a woman who has sunk from happier surroundings yes i think i have been a comfort to her she comes to me for books and we meet nearly every day at the free library and compare notes about our reading my only regret is that i cannot induce her to take enough air and exercise 
she spends all the time that she can spare from her needlework in reading but i take her for a walk now and then and i think she enjoys that a penworth of the tram-car carries us to battersea park and we can stroll about amongst grass and trees and in sight of the river she is better off than most of the girls in the way of getting a little rest after toil for that fine delicate needlework of hers pays better than the common run of work and she is the quickest worker i know the tables were cleared by this time and space had been made for that half circle round the fire of which miss newton had spoken on the previous night the younger girls brought hassocks and cushions and seated themselves in the front rank while their elders sat in the outer row of chairs theodore was now called upon to contribute his share to the entertainment and thereupon took a book from his pocket you told me you and your friends were fond of creepy stories miss newton he said is that really so really and truly and you are none of you afflicted with weak nerves you are not afraid of being made uncomfortable by the memory of a ghastly story no i think that with most of us the cares of life are too real and too absorbing to leave any room in our minds for imaginary horrors isn't it so now friends lord yes miss newton answered one of the girls briskly we're all of us too busy to worry about ghosts but i love a ghost tale for all that a chorus of voices echoed this assertion then ladies i shall have the honour of reading the haunters and the haunted by bulwer lytton the very title of the story thrilled them and the whole party just now so noisy with eager talk and frequent laughter sat breathless looking at the reader with awe-stricken eyes as that wonderful story slowly unwound itself theodore read well in that subdued and semi-dramatic style which is best adapted to chamber reading he felt what he read and the horror of the imaginary scene was vividly before his eyes as he got deeper into the story the reading lasted nearly two hours but it was not one moment too long for theodore's audience and there was a sigh of regret when the last words of the story had been spoken well exclaimed one young lady i do call that a first-class tale don't you miss newton you may go a long way without getting such a ghost tale as that said another and don't the gentleman read beautifully and don't he make one feel as if it was all going on in this very room and the dog too there i never see such a thing a poor dog to drop down dead like that i did hope that their dog would come to life again at the end said one damsel by way of diversion after the story miss newton opened her piano beckoned three of the girls over to her and played the symphony of blow gentle gales which old-fashioned glee the girls sang with taste and discretion the bass part being altered to suit a female voice then came some songs all of which miss newton accompanied and then at her request theodore read again this time selecting holmes a wonderful one-horse shay which caused much laughter after which the little clock on the chimney-piece having struck eleven he wished his hostess good-night selected his coat and hat from among the heap of jackets and hats on a table on the landing and went downstairs he was still in wedgwood street when he heard light footsteps come quickly behind him it seemed to him that they were trying to overtake him so he turned and met the owner of the feet i beg your pardon sir forgive me for following you said a very gentle voice which he recognized as belonging to the girl called marian i wanted so much to speak to you alone and i am glad of the opportunity of speaking to you he answered i felt particularly interested in you this evening there are some faces you know which interest us in spite of ourselves almost and i felt that i should like to know more of you this was so gravely said that there was no possibility of an offensive construction being given to the words you are very good sir it was your name that struck me she answered falteringly it is a dorsetshire name i think yes it is a dorsetshire name and i am a dorchester man dorchester she repeated slowly i wonder whether you know a place called cheriton i know it very well indeed a kinsman of mine lives there lord cheriton is my cousin i thought as much directly i heard your name you must know all about that dreadful murder then last summer yes i know about as much of it as any one knows and that is very little they have not found the murderer she asked with a faint shudder no nor are they likely to find him i believe but tell me why are you interested in cheriton do you come from that part of the country yes were you born in cheriton village i was brought up not far from there she answered hesitatingly 
he remembered what miss newton had told him of her own forbearance in asking questions and he pursued the inquiry no further may i see you as far as your lodgings he said kindly it will be very little out of my way no thank you mr dalbrook i am too much accustomed to going about alone ever to want any escort good night and thank you for having answered my questions her manner showed a disinclination to prolong the interview and she walked away with hurried steps which carried her swiftly into the darkness poor lonely soul he said to himself now whose lost sheep is she i wonder she is certainly of a rank above a cottager's daughter and with those hands of hers it is clear she has never been in domestic service not far from cheriton what may that mean not far is a vague description of locality i must ask lady cheriton about her the next time i am at the chase End of chapter sixteen volume one chapter seventeen of the day will come by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seventeen a mind not to be changed by place or time christmas at dorchester was not a period of festivity to which theodore dalbrook had hitherto looked forward with ardent expectations but in this particular december he found himself longing for that holiday season even as a schoolboy might long for release from latin grammar and suet pudding and for the plenteous fair and idle days of home he longed for the grave old town with its roman relics and leafless avenues longed for it alas not so much because his father brother and sisters dwelt there as because it was within a possible drive of millbrook priory and once being at dorchester he had a fair excuse for going to see his cousin many and many a time in his chambers at the temple he had felt the fever fit so strongly upon him that he was tempted to put on his hat rush out of those quiet courts and stony quadrangles to the bustle of the embankment spring into the first hansom that came within hail and so to waterloo and by any train that would carry him to wareham station and thence to the priory only to look upon juanita's face for a little while only to hold her hand in his once at greeting and once at parting and then back into the night and the loneliness of his life and law-books and precedents and justinian and chitty and all that is commonplace and dry as dust in man's existence he had refrained from such foolishness and now christmas was at hand his sisters were making the house odious with holly and laurel the old cook was chopping suet for the traditional pudding which he had loathed for the last ten years and he had a fair excuse for driving along the frosty roads to visit his widowed cousin he had a pressing invitation from lord cheriton to spend two or three days of his holiday time at the chase an invitation which he had promptly accepted but his first visit was to lady carmichael he found the house in all things unlike what it had been when last he saw it the dear grenvilles had been persuaded to spend their christmas in dorsetshire and the priory was full of children's voices and the traces of children's occupation theodore had known jessica grenville before her marriage yet it was not the less a shock to find himself confronted by a portly matron and a brood of children in that room where he had seen juanita's sad face bent over her embroidery there was no trace of juanita in the spacious drawing-room to-day and the fact of her absence almost unhinged him and put him at a disadvantage in his conversation when mrs grenville who received him with gracious loquacity and insisted upon his giving an immediate opinion upon the different degrees of family likeness to be seen in her four children there present these two are decided carmichaels she said putting forward a rather flabby boy and a pudding-faced girl and the other two are thorough grenvilles indicating the latter and younger pair who were seated on the floor building a tower of babel with a lately received present of bricks and carrying out the idea by their own confusion of tongues theodore felt glad he was not a grenville if that was the type he murmured some vague civility about the children while he shook hands with lady jane who had come forward shyly to welcome him almost obliterated by her more loquacious daughter don't you think johnny the very image of his poor dear uncle asked mrs grenville urgently a question which always agonized lady jane who could not see the faintest likeness between her snub-nosed and bilious-looking grandchild and her handsome son theodore was too nervous to be conscious of his own untruthfulness in replying in the affirmative he was anxious to have done with the children and to hear about his cousin i hope juanita is not ill he said oh no she is pretty well replied lady jane but we keep her as quiet as we can and of course the children are rather trying for her nobody can say that they are noisy children interjected the happy mother so she seldom leaves her own rooms till the evening 
continued lady jane he would like to see her at once i dare say mr dalbrook and i know she will be pleased to see you she rang and told the footman to inquire if lady carmichael was ready to see mr dalbrook and theodore had to occupy the interval until the footman's return with polite attentions to the four children he asked lucy whence she had obtained those delightful bricks thereby eliciting the information that the bricks were not lucy's but godolphin's only he let her play with them as he observed magnanimously he was gratified with the further information that the tower now in process of elevation was not a church but the tower of babel and then he was treated to the history of that remarkable building as related in holy writ you didn't know that did you remarked godolphin boastfully when he had finished his narration in a harsh bawl being one of those coarse brats whom their parents boast of as after the pattern of the infant hercules the footman returned before godolphin had wrung a confession of ignorance from the nervous visitor and theodore darted up to follow him out of the room he found juanita reclining on a low couch near the fire in the dimly lighted room that room which he remembered having entered only once before on the occasion of an afternoon party at the priory when sir godfrey had taken him to his den to show him a newly acquired folio copy of thompson's seasons with the famous bartolozzi mezzotints it was a good old room especially at this wintry season when the dullness of the outlook was of little consequence the firelight gleamed cheerily on the rich bindings of the books and on the dark woodwork and fondly touched juanita's reclining figure and the rich folds of her dark blush tea-gown how good of you to come to see me so soon theodore she said giving him her hand i know you only came to dorchester yesterday the girls were here the day before and told me they expected you you did not think i should be in the country very long without finding my way here did you juanita well no perhaps not i know what a true friend you are and now tell me have you made any further discoveries one more discovery juanita as i told you briefly in my last letter i have traced the squire's daughter to the sad close of a most unhappy life and so ends the strangway family as you know of their existence that is to say those three strangways who had come right to feel themselves aggrieved by the loss of the land upon which they were born tell me all you heard from miss newton your letter was brief and vague but as i knew i was to see you at christmas i waited for fuller details tell me everything theodore he obeyed her and related the bitter commonplace story of evelyn strangway's life as told him by her old governess there were no elements of romance in the story it was as common as the divorce court or the daily papers poor creature well there ends my theory at least about her said juanita gloomily her brothers were dead and she was dead long before that fatal night did they bequeath their vengeance to any one else i wonder who else is there in this world who had reason to hate my father or me and i know that no creature upon this earth could have cause to hate my husband in your father's calling there is always a possibility of a deadly hate inexplicable unknown to the subject remember the fate of lord mayo a judge who holds the keys of life and death must make many enemies yes she sighed there is that to be thought of oh my dearest and best why did you ever link your life with that of a judge's daughter i feel as if i had lured him to his doom i might have foreseen the danger i ought never to have married what right had i some discharged felon lay in wait for him some relentless godless hopeless wretch whom my father had condemned to long imprisonment whose angry heart my father had scorched with his scathing speech i have read some of his summings up and they have seemed cruel 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 so cold so deliberate so like a god making light of the sins of men some wretch coming maddened out of his silent cell and seeing my husband that white pure life that brave strong youth prosperous honoured happy seeing what a good man's life can be lay in wait like a tiger to destroy that happy life if it was not one of the strangways who killed him it must have been such a man her eyes shone and her cheeks flushed with a feverish red theodore took her hand held it in both his own and bent to kiss the cold fingers not with a lover's ardour fondly as he loved but with a calm and brotherly affection which soothed her agitated heart he loved her well enough to be able to subjugate himself for her sake my dear juanita if you would only withdraw your thoughts from this ghastly subject i will not ask you to forget that may be impossible 
i entreat you only to be patient to leave the chastisement of crime to providence which works in the dark works silently inevitably to the end for which we can only grope in a lame and helpless fashion be sure the murderer will stand revealed sooner or later that cruel murder will not be his last crime and in his next act of violence he may be less fortunate in escaping every human eye or if that act is to be the one solitary crime of his life something will happen to betray him some oversight of his own or some irrepressible movement of a guilty conscience will give his life to the net as a bird flies into a trap i beseech you dear let your thoughts dwell upon less painful subjects for your own sake for the sake he faltered and left his sentence unfinished and juanita knew that his sisters had told him something she knew that the one hope of her blighted life hope which she had hardly recognized as hope yet awhile was known to him i can never cease to think of that night or to pray that god will avenge that crime she said firmly you think that it is an unchristian prayer perhaps but what does the scripture say whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed christ came to confirm that righteous law oh it is well to be a humanitarian to sign petitions against capital punishment but let your nearest and dearest be murdered and you will be quick to recognize the justice of that old inexorable law a life for a life that is what i want theodore the life of the man who killed my husband if i can help to bring about that end juanita believe me that i will not shrink from the task but at present i must own that i am off the track and see no likelihood of succeeding where a trained detective has failed could i but find a shred of evidence to put me on the trail i would pursue that clue to the bitter end but so far all is dark yes all is dark she answered dejectedly and then after a pause she said you are going to stay at cheriton i hear i am to spend three days there at the turn of the year just before i go back to london i have chambers in ferret court over the rooms in which your father spent the golden years of his youth the years that made him a great man it will be very interesting to me to hear him talk over those years if i can beguile him into talking of himself a subject which he so seldom dwells upon ask him if he ever made a bitter enemy ask him for his experience as a judge at assizes find out if you can whether he ever provoked the hatred of a bad vindictive man i will question your father juanita do he will not let me talk to him about the one subject that occupies my mind he always stops me on the threshold of any inquiries he might surely help me to find the murderer with his highly trained intellect with his experience of the darkest side of human nature but he will not help me he would talk more freely to you no doubt i will sound him answered theodore and then he tried to beguile her to talking of other things her home her surroundings it must be a comfort to you to have lady jane a comfort she is all that i have of happiness all that reminds me of godfrey my mother and father are very dear to me i hope you believe that theodore but our lives are parted now my mother is wrapped up in her husband neither of them can sympathize with me as his mother can their loss is not the same as ours we two are one in our grief and she is a buffer between you and the outer world i see she bears the burdens that would weigh you down those children for instance no doubt they are charming as children go but i fancy they would worry you if you had too much of them they would kill me said juanita smiling at him for the first time in their interview i am not very fond of children it sounds unwomanly to say so but i often find myself wishing they could be born grown up fortunately lady jane adores them and i am glad to have the grenvilles at christmas time i want all things to be as they would have been were my dearest here i lie here and look round this room which was his and think and think and think of him till i almost fancy he is here idle fancy mocking dream oh if you knew how often i dream that he is living still and that i am still his happy wife i dream that he has been dead or at least that we have all believed that he was dead but that it was a mistake he is alive our own for long years to come the wild rapture of that dream wakes me and i know that i am alone god keep you theodore from such a loss as mine i must gain something before i can lose it he answered with a shade of bitterness 
i see myself as the years go on hardening into a lonely old bachelor outliving the capacity for human affection that is nonsense talk you think so just now perhaps there is no one beyond your own family you care for and you fancy yourself shut out from the romance of life but your day will come very suddenly perhaps you will see some one whom you can care for love will enter your life unawares and will fill your heart and mind and the ambition that absorbs you now will seem a small thing never juanita i don't mean to plague you with any trouble of mine you have given me your friendship and i hope to be worthy of it but pray do not talk to me of the chances of the future my future is bounded by the hope of getting on at the bar if i fail in that i fail in everything you will not fail there is no reason you should not prosper in your profession as my father prospered i often think that you are like him more like him than you are like your own father their talk touched on various subjects after this on the great events of the world the events that make history on books and theatres and then upon sarah newton whose plan of life interested juanita he told her of the girl called marian and her inquiries about cheriton i wonder if you ever knew her among your villagers he said i should much like to know who she is she interests me more than i can say there is a refinement in her manners and appearance that convinces me she must have belonged to superior people she was never born in a labourer's cottage or amidst a small shopkeeper's shabby surroundings she was never taught at a national school or broken into domestic service and she was once very handsome you say yes she must have been beautiful before illness and trouble set their marks upon her face she is only a wreck now but there is beauty in the wreck how old do you suppose her to be eight or nine and twenty it is difficult to guess a woman's age within two or three years and this woman's face is evidently aged by trouble but i don't think she can be thirty there is only one person i can think of who would in any manner answer your description said juanita thoughtfully who is that mercy porter you must have heard about mercy porter the daughter of the woman at the west lodge yes yes i remember she ran away with a middle-aged man an army man one of your father's visitors i was a child at the time and of course i heard very little about it i only knew that mercy porter who used to come to tea with mother and who played the piano better than my governess suddenly vanished out of our lives and that i never saw her again my mother was quite fond of her and i remember hearing of her beauty though i was too young myself to know what beauty meant i could not think any one pretty who wore such plain frocks and such stout useful boots as mercy wore her mother certainly did nothing to set off her good looks or to instil vanity years after my mother told me how the girl disappeared one summer evening and how mrs porter came distracted to the house and saw my father and stormed and raved at him in her agony saying it was his friend who had blighted her daughter's youth his work that she had gone to her ruin he was very patient and forbearing with her my mother said for he pitied her despair and he felt that he was in some wise to blame for having brought such an unprincipled man as colonel tremaine to cheriton a man who had carried ruin into many homes mercy had been seen to leave wareham station with him by the night mail he had a yacht at weymouth she wrote to her mother from london a fortnight afterwards and mrs porter brought the letter to my mother and father one morning as they sat at breakfast it was a heartbroken letter the letter of a poor foolish girl who flings away her good name and her hope of heaven with her eyes open and knows the cost of her sacrifice and yet can't help making it i was engaged to godfrey when i first heard mercy's story and i felt so sorry for her so sorry in the midst of my happy love what had i done to deserve happiness more than she that life should be so bright for me and so dark for her i did not know that my day of agony was to come did you ever hear how colonel tremaine treated her no i believe my father wrote him a very severe letter and called upon him to repair the wrong he had done but i don't think he even took so much trouble as to answer that letter his regiment was ordered off to india two or three years afterwards and he was killed in afghanistan about six years ago and has nothing been heard of mercy since her flight nothing i wonder her mother has sat at home quietly all these years instead of making strenuous efforts to find her lost lamb said theodore ah that is almost exactly what godfrey said of her he seemed to think her heartless for taking things so quietly she is a curious woman self-contained and silent i sometimes fancy she was more angry than grieved at mercy's fate 
mother says she turns to ice at the slightest mention of the girl's name don't you think love would show itself differently one can never be sure about other people's sentiments love has many languages their talk drifted to more commonplace subjects and then theodore rose to take leave you must dine at the priory before your holiday is over theo said his cousin as they shook hands let me see to-morrow will be christmas day will you come the day after and bring the sisters it is too long a drive for a winter night so you must stay there is plenty of room are you sure we shall not bore you i am sure you will cheer me my sister-in-law is very good but lady jane is the only person in this house of whom i do not get desperately tired including myself she added with a sigh please say you will come and i will order your rooms we will come then good night juanita the shadows were falling as he drove away after refusing tea in the drawing-room and a further acquaintance with the wonderful children he looked forward to that evening at the priory with an eager expectancy that he knew to be supreme foolishness and when the evening came it brought some measure of disappointment with it juanita was not so well as she had been upon christmas eve she was not able to dine downstairs and the family dinner at which the etonian tom johnny and lucy were allowed to take their places in virtue of christmas time was a dull business for theodore his only pleasure was in the fact that he sat on lady jane's right hand and was able to talk with her of juanita even that pleasure was alloyed with keenest pain for lady jane's talk was of that dead love which cast its shadow over juanita's youth or of that dim and dawning hope which might brighten the coming days and neither in the love of the past nor in the love of the future had theodore any part juanita was on her sofa by the drawing-room fire when he and mr grenville left the dining-room after a single glass of claret and a brief review of the political situation theodore's sisters were established on each side of her there was no chance for him while they were absorbing her attention and he retired disconsolately to the group in the middle of the room where mrs grenville and lady jane were seated on a capacious ottoman with the children about them johnny and lucy who had overeaten themselves were disposed to be quiet the little girl leaning her fair curls and fat shining cheek against her grandmother's shoulder with an air that looked touching but which really indicated repletion johnny sprawling on the carpet at his mother's feet and wishing he had not eaten that mince pie telling himself that on the whole he hated mince pie and envying his brother tom who had stolen off to the saddle-room to talk to the grooms godolphin and mabel having dined early were full of exuberance waiting to be jumped which entertainment theodore had to provide without intermission for nearly half an hour upheaving first one and then another towards the ceiling first a rosy bundle in ruby velvet and then a rosy bundle in white muslin laughing screaming enraptured to be caught in his arms and set carefully on the ground there to await the next turn theodore slaved at this recreation until his arms ached casting a furtive glance every now and then at the corner by the fireplace where his sisters were treating juanita to the result of their latest heavy reading at last to his delight lucy recovered from her comatose condition and began to thirst for amusement let's have magic music she said we can all play at that granny and all you know you love magic music granny who'll play the piano not mother she plays so badly added the darling with childlike candour sophie shall play for you cried theodore she's a capital hand at it he went over to his sister go and play for the children sophie he said i've been doing my duty go and do yours sophie looked agonized but complied and he slipped into her vacant seat he sat by his cousin's side for nearly an hour while the children mother and grandmother played their nursery game to the sound of dance music now low now loud neatly executed by sophie's accurate fingers their talk was of indifferent subjects and the lion's share of the conversation was enjoyed by janet but to theodore it was bliss to be there by his cousin's side within sound of her low melodious voice within touch of her tapering hand just to sit there and watch her face and drink in the tones of her voice was enough he asked no more from fate yet a while he had a long talk with her in her own room next morning before he went back to dorchester and the talk was of that old subject which absorbed her thoughts be sure you find out all you can from my father she said at parting life at cheriton chase bore no slight impress of the tragedy that had blighted juanita's honeymoon there were no festivities this winter there was no large house-party 
there had been a few quiet elderly or middle-aged visitors during the shooting season and there had been some slaughter of those pheasants which were wont to sit ponderous and sleepy as barn-door fowls upon the five barred gates and post and rail fences of the chase but even those sober guests old friends of husband and wife had all departed and the house was empty of strangers when theodore arrived there in time for dinner on new year's eve nothing could have suited him better than this he wanted to be tete-a-tete -tete with lord cheriton to glean all in the way of counsel or reminiscence that might fall from those wise lips if there is a man living who can teach me how to get on in my profession it is james dalbrook he said to himself thinking of his cousin by that name which he had so often heard his father use when talking of old days lady cheriton greeted him affectionately made him sit by her in the library where a richly embroidered japanese screen made a cosy corner by the fireplace during the twenty minutes before dinner she was a handsome woman still with that grand-looking spanish beauty which does not fade with youth and she was dressed to perfection in lustreless black silk relieved by the glitter of jet here and there and by the soft white crape kerchief worn a la marie antoinette there was not one thread of grey in the rich black hair piled in massive plates upon the prettily shaped head theodore contemplated her with an almost worshipping admiration it was juanita's face he saw in those classic lines i want to have a good talk with you theo she said there is no one else to whom i can talk so freely now my poor godfrey is gone we sit here of an evening now you see the drawing-room is only used when there are people in the house and even then i feel miserable there i cannot get his image out of my mind cheriton insists that the room shall be used that it shall not be made a haunted room and no doubt it is best so but one cannot forget such a tragedy as that i hope juanita will forget some day ah that is what i try to hope she is so young at the very beginning of life and it does seem hard that all those hopes for which other women live should be over and done with for her i wish i could believe in the power of time to cure her i wish i could believe that she will be able to love somebody else as she loved godfrey if she does i dare say it will be some new person who had nothing to do with her past life i had been in and out of love before i met james dalbrook but the sight of him seemed like the beginning of a new life i felt as if it had been preordained that i was to love him and only him that nothing else had been real yes theodore with a sigh you may depend if ever she should care for anybody it will be a new person very lucky for the new person and rather hard upon any one who happens to have loved her all his life is there any one like that i think you know there is lady cheriton yes yes my dear boy i know she answered kindly laying her soft hand upon his i won't pretend not to know i wish with all my heart you could make her care for you theodore a year or two hence you would be a good and true husband to her a kind father to godfrey's child that fatherless child oh theodore is it not sad to think of the child who will never not for one brief hour feel the touch of a father's hand or know the blessing of a father's love such a dead blank where there should be warmth and life and joy we must wait theo who can dispose of the future i shall be a happy woman if ever you can tell me you have won the reward of a life's devotion god bless you for your goodness to me he faltered kissing the soft white hand so like in form and outline to juanita's hand only plumper and more matronly they dined snugly a cosy trio in a small room hung with genuine old cordovan leather and adorned with moorish crockery a room which was called her ladyship's parlour and which had been one of lord sheridan's birthday gifts to his wife furnished and decorated during her absence at a german spa when lady cheriton left them the two men turned their chairs towards the fire lighted their cigars and settled themselves for an evening's talk the great lawyer was in one of his pleasantest moods he gave theodore the benefit of his experience as a stuff gown and did all that the advice of a wise senior can do towards putting a tyro on the right track you will have to bide your time he said in conclusion it is a tedious business you must sit in your chambers and read till your chance comes always be there that's the grand point don't be out when fortune knocks at your door she will come in a very insignificant shape on her earlier visits with a shabby little two-guinea brief in her hand but don't you let that shabby little brief be carried to somebody else just because you are out of the way i suppose you are really fond of the law yes i am very fond of my profession 
it is meat and drink to me then you will get on any man of moderate abilities is bound to succeed in any profession which he loves with a heart whole love and your abilities are much better than moderate there was a little pause in the talk while lord cheriton threw on a fresh log and lighted a second cigar i have been meditating a good deal upon sir godfrey's murder said theodore and i am perplexed by the utter darkness which surrounds the murderer and his motive no doubt you have some theory upon the subject no i have no theory there is really nothing upon which to build a theory churton the detective talked about a vendetta suggested poacher tenant tramp gypsy any member of the dangerous classes who might happen to consider himself aggrieved by poor godfrey he even went so far as to make a very unpleasant suggestion and urged that there might be a woman at the bottom of the business speculated upon some youthful intrigue of godfrey's now from all i know of that young man i believe his life had been blameless he was the soul of honour he would never have dealt cruelly with any woman and you lord cheriton said theodore hardly following the latter part of his cousin's speech in his self-absorption his kinsman started and looked at him indignantly and you in your capacity of judge for instance have you never made a deadly foe well i suppose the men and women i have sentenced have hardly loved me but i doubt if the worst of them ever had any strong personal feeling about me they have taken me as a part of the machinery of the law of no more account than the iron door of a cell or a beam of the scaffold yet there have been instances of active malignity the assassination of lord mayo for instance oh the assassin in that case was an indian and a maniac we live in a different latitude besides it is rather too far-fetched an idea to suppose that a man would shoot my son-in-law in order to avenge himself upon me the shot may have been fired under a misapprehension the figure seated reading in the lamplight may have been mistaken for you the assassin must have been uncommonly short-sighted to make such a mistake i won't say such a thing would be impossible for experience has taught me that there is nothing in this life too strange to be true but it is too unlikely a notion to dwell upon indeed i think theodore we must dismiss this painful business from our minds if the mystery is ever to be cleared up it will be by a fluke but even that seems to me a very remote contingency have you not observed that if a murderer is not caught within three months of his crime he is hardly ever caught at all i might almost say if he is not caught within one month once let the scent cool and the chances are a hundred to one in his favour yet juanita has set her heart upon seeing her husband avenged ah that is where her spanish blood shows itself an englishwoman pure and simple would think only of her sorrow my poor girl hungers for revenge providence may favour her perhaps but i doubt it the best thing that can happen to her will be to forget her first husband fine young fellow as he was and choose a second it is horrible to think that the rest of her life is to be a blank with her beauty and position she may look high i am obliged to be ambitious for my daughter you see theodore since heaven has not spared me a son theodore saw only too plainly that whatever favour his hopes might have from soft-hearted lady cheriton his own kinsman james dalbrook would be against him this mattered very little to him at present in the face of the lady's indifference one gleam of hope from juanita herself would have seemed more to him than all the favour of parents or kindred it was her hand that held his fate it was she alone who could make his life blessed new year's day was fine but frosty a sharp clear day on which cheriton park looked loveliest the trees made fairy-like by the light rime the long stretches of turf touched with a silvery whiteness the distant copses and boundary of pine trees half hidden in a pale grey mist theodore walked across the park with lady cheriton to the eleven o'clock service in the church at the end of cheriton village it was nearly a mile from the great house to the fine old fifteenth-century church but lady cheriton always walked to church in decent weather albeit her servants were conveyed there luxuriously in a capacious omnibus specially retained for their use on the way along the silent avenue theodore told her of his meeting with miss newton's protege and of juanita's idea that the woman called marian might be no other than mercy porter i certainly remember no other case of a girl about here leaving her home under disgraceful circumstances that is to say any girl of refinement and education said lady cheriton there have been cases among the villagers no doubt 
but if this girl of yours is really a superior person and really comes from sheraton i think juanita is right and that you must have stumbled upon mercy porter her mother ought to be told about it without delay will you tell her or will you put me in the way of doing so would you like to see mrs porter yes i feel interested in her chiefly because she may be marian's mother i shall have to go to work very carefully so as not to cause her too keen a disappointment in the event of juanita's guess being wrong i do not know that you will find her very soft-hearted where her daughter is concerned replied lady cheriton thoughtfully i sometimes fear that she has hardened herself against that unhappy girl the troubles of her own early life may have hardened her perhaps it is not easy to bear a long series of troubles with patience and gentleness do you know much of her history only that she lost her husband when she was still a young woman and that she was left to face the world penniless with her young daughter if my husband had not happened to hear of her circumstances heaven knows what would have become of her he had been intimate with her husband when he was a young man in london and it seemed to him a duty to do what he could for her so he pensioned off an old gardener who used to live in that pretty cottage and he had the cottage thoroughly renovated for mrs porter she had a little furniture of a rather superior kind warehoused in london and with this she was able to make a snug and pretty home for herself as you will see if you call upon her after the service you are sure to see her at church was she very fond of her little girl in those days i hardly know people have different ways of showing affection she was very strict with poor mercy she educated her at home and never allowed her to associate with any of the village children she kept the child entirely under her own wing so that the poor little thing had actually no companion but her mother a middle-aged woman saddened by trouble i felt very sorry for the child and i used to have her up at the house for an afternoon now and then just to introduce some variety into her life when she grew up into a beautiful young woman her mother seemed to dislike these visits and stipulated that mercy should only come to see me when there were no visitors in the house she did not want her head turned by any of those foolish compliments which frivolous people are so fond of paying to a girl of that age never thinking of the mischief they may do i told her that i thought she was over careful and that as mercy must discover that she was handsome sooner or later it was just as well that she should gain some experience of life at once her instinctive self-respect would teach her how to take care of herself and if she could be safe anywhere she would be safe with me mrs porter is a rather obstinate person and she took her own way she kept mercy as close as if she had been an oriental slave and yet somehow colonel tremaine contrived to make love to her and tempted her away from her home perhaps if that home had been a little less dismal the girl might have not been so easily tempted they had left the park by this time and were nearing the church a scanty congregation came slowly in after lady cheriton and her companion had taken their seats in the chancel pew the congregation was chiefly feminine middle-aged women in everyday bonnets and fur-trimmed cloaks with their shoulders up to their ears girls in felt hats and smart tight-fitting jackets a few pious villagers of advanced years spectacled feeble with wrinkled faces half hidden under poke bonnets two representative old men with long white hair and quavering voices whose shrill treble was distinguishable above the rustic choir amidst this sparse congregation theodore had no difficulty in discovering mrs porter she sat in one of the front benches on the left side of the aisle which side was reserved for the tradespeople and humbler inhabitants of cheriton while the benches on the right were occupied by the county people and some small fry who ranked with those elect of the earth with them but not of them a retired banker and his wife the village doctor the village lawyer and two or three female annuitants of good family a noticeable woman this mrs porter anywhere she was tall and thin straight as a dart with strongly marked features and white hair her complexion was pale and sallow the kind of skin which is generally described as sickly if she had ever been handsome all traces of that former beauty had disappeared it was a hard face without womanly charm yet with an unmistakable air of refinement she wore her neat little black straw bonnet and black cloth mantle like a lady and she walked like a lady as theodore saw presently when that portion of the little band of worshippers which did not remain for the celebration dribbled slowly out of the church he left lady cheriton kneeling in her pew and followed mrs porter out of the porch and along the village street and thence into that rustic lane which led to the west lodge 
he had spoken to her only once in his life on a summer morning when he had happened to find her standing at her garden gate and when it had been impossible for her to avoid him he knew that she must have seen him going in and out of the park gates often enough for his appearance to be familiar to her so he had no scruple in introducing himself good morning mrs porter he said overtaking her in the deeply sunk lane between those rocky banks where hart's tongue and polypodium grew so luxuriantly in summer and where even in this wintry season the lichens and mosses spread their rich colouring over grey stone and brown earth and above which the snow-laden boughs showed white against the blue brightness of the sky she turned and bowed stiffly good morning sir you haven't forgotten me i hope i am theodore dalbrook of dorchester i think you must have seen me pass your window too often to forget me easily i am not much given to watching the people who pass in and out sir when his lordship gave me the cottage he was good enough to allow me a servant to open the park gate as he knew that i was not strong enough to bear exposure to all kinds of weather i am free to live my own life therefore without thinking of his lordship's visitors i am sorry to intrude myself upon your notice mrs porter but i want to speak to you upon a very delicate subject and i must ask your forgiveness in advance if i should touch upon an old wound she looked at him curiously shrinkingly even with a latent anger in her pale eyes eyes that had been lovely once perhaps but which time or tears had faded to a glassy dullness i have no desire to discuss old wounds with any one she said coldly my troubles at least are my own not altogether your own mrs porter the sorrow of which i am thinking involves another life the life of one who has been dear to you i have nothing to do with any other life not even with the life of your only child not even with the life of my only child she answered doggedly she left me of her own accord and i have done with her for ever i stand utterly alone in this world utterly alone she repeated and if i tell you that i think and believe i have found your daughter in london very poor working for her living very sad and lonely her beauty faded her life joyless would you not wish to know more would not your heart yearn towards her no i tell you i have done with her she has passed out of my life i stand alone there was a tone of finality in these words which left no room for argument theodore lifted his hat and walked on end of chapter 17volume 1 chapter 18 of the day will come by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 18 o sovereign power of love o grief o balm all records saving thine come cool and calm and shadowy through the mist of past years harrington dalbrook having in a manner given hostages to fortune entered upon his new career with a strength of purpose and a resolute industry which took his father by surprise upon my word harry i did not think there was so much grit in you said mr dalbrook i thought you and your sisters were too much stuffed with modern culture to be capable of old-fashioned work i hope my dear father you don't think education and intellect out of place in a lawyer far from it we have had too many examples to the contrary from bacon to brougham from hale to cockburn but i was afraid of the dilettante spirit the talk about books which you had only half read the smattering of subjects that need the work of a lifetime to be properly understood i was afraid of our modern electroplate culture the process which throws a brilliant film of education over a foundation of ignorance however you have surprised me harry i own that i was disappointed by your want of purpose at the university but i begin to respect you now i find you attack your work in the right spirit i want to get on answered harrington gravely hanging his head a little in shame at his own reticence from so good a father he felt it was a kind of dishonour to keep a secret but juliet baldwin had insisted upon secrecy and the name of every fiance in the early stages of an engagement is she who must be obeyed harrington said not a word therefore as to that mighty prime mover which was urging him to dogged perseverance in a profession for which he had as yet no real inclination he put aside darwin and spencer max muller and seeley schopenhauer and hartmann all those true or false lights which he had followed through the mazes of free thought and he set himself to master the stern actualities of the law he had not done well at the university not because he was wanting in brains but because he was wanting in concentration and doggedness 
the prime mover being supplied and of a prodigious power harrington brought his intellectual forces to bear upon a given point and made a rapid advance in legal knowledge and acumen the old cook-house keeper complained of the coals and candles which master harry consumed during his after midnight studies and wondered that the household were not all burnt in their beds by reason of the young gentleman dropping off to sleep over coke upon littleton the sisters complained that they had now practically no brother since harrington who had a pretty tenor voice and had hitherto been a star at afternoon teas and evening parties refused to go anywhere except to those few houses county where miss baldwin might be met scarcely had the new year begun when miss baldwin went off upon a visit to one of the largest houses in wiltshire and one of the smartest a house under the dominion of a childless widow gifted with a large income and a sympathetic temperament a lady who allowed her life to be influenced and directed by a family of nephews and nieces and whose house was declared by the advanced section of society to be quite the most perfect house to stay in don't you know miss baldwin did not leave the neighbourhood of dorchester and her lover without protestations of regret the thing was a bore a sacrifice on her part but it must be done she had promised dear old lady burdenshaw ages ago and to lady burdenshaw's she must go you needn't worry about it she said with her off-hand air lolling on the billiard-room settee in the grey winter afternoon on the second sunday of the year if you are at all keen upon being at medlow court while i am there i'll make dear old lady burdenshaw send you an invitation you are very good replied harrington and i should like staying in the same house with you but i couldn't think of visiting a lady i don't know or of caging for an invitation sir henry had asked his friend to luncheon and now after a somewhat spartan meal of roast mutton and rice pudding the lovers were alone in the billiard-room sir henry having crept off to the stables the table was kept rigorously covered on sundays in deference to the dowager's sabbatarian leanings and there was nothing for her son to do in the billiard-room except to walk listlessly up and down and stare at some very dingy examples of the early italian school or to take the cues out of the rack one by one to see which of them wanted topping oh but you needn't mind you would be capital friends with lady b we all call her lady b because a three-syllable name is too much for anybody's patience i tell her she ought to drop a syllable lady burshaw would do just as well i suppose though if i were to get an invitation you could hardly be spared from the shop concluded juliet with a laugh hardly i have to stick very close to the shop replied harrington blushing a little at the word remember what i am working for a family practice in london and a house that you need not be ashamed to inhabit to me that means as much as the red ribbon of the bath means to a soldier or sailor my ambition goes no further unless it were to a seat in parliament later on you are a good earnest soul yes of course you must go into parliament in spite of all the riff-raff that has got into the house of late years boys home rulers city men there is a faint flavour of distinction in the letters m p after a man's name it helps him just a little in society to be able to talk about my constituents and to contemplate european politics from the standpoint of the town that has elected him yes you must be in the house by and by harry you told me you were tired of country house visiting said harrington who for the first time since his betrothal felt somewhat inclined to quarrel with his divinity so i am heartily sick of it and i shall rejoice when i have a snug little nest of my own in clarges or hertford street but you must admit that medlow court is better than this house behold our average sunday roast mutton rice pudding and invincible dullness all the servants except an under footman gone to afternoon church and no possibility of a cup of tea till nearly six o'clock a cold dinner at eight and family prayers at ten what kind of a sunday do you have at medlow il y en a pour tous les goûts medlow is liberty hall if we were even to take it into our heads to have family prayers lady burdenshaw would send for her chaplain pluck him out of the bosom of his family and order him to read them she doesn't like cards on a sunday because of the servants but after the clock has struck eleven we may do what we please play poker nap euchre baccarat till daylight if we are in the humour the billiard and smoke-rooms and the ballroom are at one end of the house ever so far from the servants quarters we can have as much fun as we like while those rustic souls are snoring harrington sighed ever so faintly 
this picture of a fashionable interior was perfectly innocent and his betrothed's way of looking at things meant nothing worse than girlish exuberance fine animal spirits but the sans gene of medlow court was hardly the kind of training he would have chosen for his future wife and then he looked at the handsome profile the piled-up mass of ruddy brown hair on the top of the haughtily poised head the perfectly fitting tailor gown with its aristocratic simplicity costing so much more than plebeian silks and satins and he told himself that he was privileged in having won such exalted beauty to ally itself with his humble fortunes such a girl would shine as a duchess and if marriageable dukes had eyes to see with and judgment to guide their choice that lovely auburn head would ere now have been crowned with a tiara of family diamonds instead of waiting for the poor sprigs of orange blossom which alone may adorn the brow of the solicitor's bride shall we go for a stroll in the grounds asked juliet with a restless air and an impatient shiver perhaps it will be warmer out of doors than it is here we keep such miserable fires in this house i believe the grates were chosen with a view to burning the minimum of coal i shall be delighted laura was absent on a visit to yorkshire cousins strong-minded like herself and with no pretensions to fashion lady baldwin had retired for her afternoon siesta on sundays she always read herself to sleep with taylor or south on weekdays she nodded over the morning paper she had gone to the morning-room with the idea that henry would take his friend to the stables and that juliet would require no looking after it had never entered into her ladyship's head that her handsome daughter would look so low as the son of her solicitor juliet was therefore free to do what she pleased with her afternoon and her pleasure was to walk in the chilly shrubberies and the bare grey park sparsely timbered and with about as little forestal beauty as a gentleman's park can possess she put on an old sealskin jacket and a toque to match which she kept in the room where her brother kept his overcoats and which smelt of tobacco after the manner of everything that came with sir henry's influence and then she led the way to a half-glass door which opened on a grass plot at the side of the house and she and her lover went out you can smoke if you like she said you know i don't mind i'll have a cigarette with you in the shrubbery dearest juliet i can't tell you how glad i should be if you would smoke less he said nervously blushing at his own earnestness you think i smoke too many cigarettes that they are really bad for me she asked carelessly it isn't that i wasn't thinking about their effect on your health but i know you will call it old-fashioned nonsense i can't bear to see the woman who is to be my wife with a cigarette between her lips and when i am your wife i suppose you will cut me off from tobacco altogether i should never be a domestic tyrant juliet but it would wound me to see my wife smoke just as much as it wounds me now when i see you smoke half a dozen cigarettes in succession what a philistine you are harry well you shall not be tortured i'll ease off the smoking if i can but a whiff or two of an egyptian soothes me when my nerves are overstrained you are as bad as my mother who thinks cigarette smoking one stage on the road to perdition and rather an advanced stage too you are very easily shocked harry if an innocent little cigarette can shock you i wonder if you are really fond of me now the novelty of our engagement has worn off i am fonder of you every day i live enthusiastic boy if that is true you may be able to stand a worse shocker than my poor little cigarette harrington turned pale but he took the hand which she held out to him and grasped it firmly what was she going to tell him harry i want to make a financial statement i want you to help me if you can i am up to my eyes in debt in debt yes it sounds bad don't it debt and tobacco should be exclusively masculine vices i owe money all round not large sums but the sum total is large i have had to hold my own in smart houses upon an allowance which some women would spend with their shoemaker my mother gives me a hundred and twenty-five pounds a year for everything tips travelling expenses clothes music and i am not going to say anything unkind about her on that score for i don't see how she could give me more her own means come to something under eighteen hundred a year and she has this place to keep up henry takes all the rents and often keeps her waiting for her income which is a first charge upon the estate if it were not for your father who looks after her interests as sharply as he can she might fare much worse henry brings as many men as he likes here and contributes nothing to the housekeeping and you owe money to milliners and people said harrington deeply distressed by his sweetheart's humiliation which he felt more keenly than the lady herself 
juliet had lived among girls who talked freely of their debts and difficulties of sops to cerberus and getting round an unwilling dressmaker harrington's lines had been set among old-fashioned countrified people to whom debt and especially feminine indebtedness meant disgrace he had come back from the university feeling like a murderer because he had exceeded his allowance milliners dressmakers shoemakers hatters and ever so many more i am afraid i have been rather reckless only i thought i thought i should make a great match she would have said had she followed her idea to its close but she checked herself abruptly and cut off a sprig of yew with a swing of the stick she carried if i can help you in any way began harrington my dear boy there is only one way in which you can help me lend me any money you can spare say fifty pounds and i will give it you back by instalments of ten or fifteen pounds a quarter it would be mockery for me to pretend i could pay you in a lump sum now i have told you the extent of my income harrington's worldly wealth at that moment was something under fifty pounds his father had given him a cheque for fifty on christmas eve and he had no right to expect anything more till lady day while he had to think of the black horse who was steadily eating his head off at livery and for whom nothing had been paid as yet he could not find it in his heart to tell his affiance that he was comparatively speaking a pauper he knew that his father had the reputation of wealth a man always ready to invest in any odd parcel of land that was in the market and who was known to possess a good many small holdings and houses in his native town and its neighbourhood could he tell her that her future husband was still in leading strings and that the run of his teeth and fifty pounds a quarter were all he could count upon till he was out of his articles no he would rather perish than reveal these despicable facts so although he had only forty-three pounds odd in his little cash-box he told her that he would let her have fifty pounds in a day or two if you could manage to bring it to me to-morrow i should be very glad said juliet who once having broken the ice talked about the loan with easy frankness i must have a new frock for the ball at medlow they are to have a ball on the first of february the ball of the year there will be no end of smart people i want to send estelle dawson thirty-five or forty pounds about half the amount of her last bill it's a paltry business altogether i know girls who owe their dressmakers hundreds where i owe tens let me have the cash to-morrow if you can there's a dear miss dawson is sure to be full of work for the country at this season and she won't make my frock unless i give her a week's notice of course dear yes you shall have the money harrington answered nervously but your white gown at our ball looked lovely why shouldn't you wear that at medlow my white gown would be better described as black retorted the young lady with marked acidity if i didn't hate the dorchester people like poison i wouldn't have insulted them by wearing such a rag i would no more appear in it at medlow than i would cut my throat language so strong as this for bad argument harrington concluded that there was a mystery in these things outside the limits of masculine understanding to his eye the white satin and tulle his betrothed had worn had seemed faultless but it may be that the glamour of first love acts like limelight upon a soiled white garment and no doubt miss baldwin's gown had seen service he walked back to the house with her and left her at the door just as it was growing dusk and the servants were coming home from church he left her with a fictitious appearance of cheerfulness promising to go to tea on the following afternoon he was glad of the six-mile walk to dorchester as it gave him solitude for deliberation at home the keen eyes of his sisters would be upon him and he would be pestered by inquiries as to what there had been for lunch and what miss baldwin wore while the still more penetrating gaze of his father would be quick to perceive anything amiss oh juliet if you knew how hard you are making our engagement to me he ejaculated mentally as he walked with the unconscious hurry of an agitated mind along the frost-bound road there had been a hard frost since christmas and hunting had been out of the question whereby the existence of mahmoud and the bill at the livery stable seemed so much heavier a burden somehow or other he must get the difference between forty-three pounds and fifty only seven pounds a paltry sum no doubt but it would hardly do for him to leave himself penniless until lady day he might be called on at any moment for small sums short of shamming illness and stopping in bed till the end of the quarter he could not possibly escape the daily calls which every young man has upon his purse he told himself therefore that he must contrive to borrow fifteen or twenty pounds but of whom that was the question 
his first thought was naturally of his brother but in the next moment he remembered how theodore in his financial arrangements with his father had insisted upon cutting himself down to the very lowest possible allowance you will pay all my fees dad and give me enough money to furnish my chambers decently with the help of the things i am to have out of this house and you will allow me so much he said naming a very modest sum for maintenance till i begin to get briefs i want to feel the spur of poverty i want to work for my bread of course i know i have a court of appeal here if my exchequer should run dry remembering this harrington felt that he could not at the very beginning of things pester his brother for a loan the same court of appeal the father's well-filled purse was open to him but he had no excuse to offer no reason to give for exceeding his allowance he might sell mahmoud if there were not two obstacles to that transaction the first that nobody in the neighbourhood wanted to buy him the second that he was not yet paid for except by that bill which rose like a pale blue spectre before the young man's eyes as he was dropping off to sleep of a night and sometimes spoiled his rest he would have to sell mahmoud in order not to dishonour that bill and if the horse should fetch considerably less than the price given for him as all equine experience led his owner to fear whence was to come the difference that was a problem which would have to be solved somehow before the tenth of march he would have to send the beast to tattersall's most likely the common experience of the hunting field having taught him that nobody ever sells a horse among his own circle he saw himself realizing something under fifty pounds as the price of the black and having to bridge over the distance between that amount and eighty as best he might but march was not to-morrow and he had first of all to provide for to-morrow a mere trifle but it would have to be borrowed and the sensation of borrowing was new to matthew dalbrook's son he had frittered away his ready money at the university and he had got into debt but he had never borrowed money of jew or gentile and now the time had come when he must borrow of whomsoever he could he took tea with his sisters in the good homely old-fashioned drawing-room which was at its best in winter the four tall narrow windows closely curtained a roaring fire in the wide iron grate and a modern japanese tea-table wheeled in front of it five o'clock tea was of a more substantial order on sundays than on weekdays on account of the nine o'clock supper which took the place of the seven o'clock dinner and accommodated those who cared to attend evening church lady baldwin's spartan luncheon had not indisposed her guest for cake and muffins and basking in the glow of the fire harrington forgot his troubles enjoyed his tea and maintained a very fair appearance of cheerfulness while his sisters questioned and his father put in an occasional word i'm afraid you are getting rather too friendly at the mount said matthew dalbrook i don't like sir henry baldwin and i don't think he's an advantageous friend for you oh but we're old chums said harrington blushing a little we were at oxford together you know i'm afraid we both know it harry and to our cost replied his father you might have succeeded in your divinity exam if it hadn't been for this fine gentleman friend of yours i'm not sorry i failed father the law suits me ever so much better than the church so long as you stick to that opinion i'm satisfied only don't go to the mount too often and don't let the handsome miss baldwin make a fool of you if it had not been for the coloured shades over the lamps which were so artistic as to be useless for seeing purposes harrington might have been seen to turn pale no fear of that sophia exclaimed contemptuously juliet baldwin is not likely to give a provincial solicitor any encouragement she's a girl who expects to marry for position and though she is just a shade passe she may make a good match even yet she comes here because she likes us but she's a thorough woman of the world and you needn't be afraid of her running after harry harrington grew as red as a peony with suppressed indignation perhaps as the baldwins are my friends you might be able to get on without talking any more about them he said scowling at his elder sister i've told you what we had for lunch and how many servants were in the room and what kind of gown juliet miss baldwin was wearing don't you think we've had enough of them for to-night quite enough harry quite enough said the father by the by did you read the times leader on gladstone's last manifesto and where are the field and the observer bring me over a lamp that i can see by sophie my dear these crimson lampshades of yours suggest one of orchardson's pictures but they don't help me to read my paper they're the beastliest things i ever saw said harrington vindictively i'm sorry you don't like them said janet it was juliet baldwin who persuaded us to buy them she had seen some at medlow court and she raved about them 
harrington went out of the room without another word how odious his sisters had become of late yet while he was at oxford they had regarded him as an oracle and he had found even sisterly appreciation pleasant it was some time since he had attended evening service but on this particular evening he went alone not troubling to invite his sisters who were subject to an intermittent form of neuralgia which often prevented their going to church in the evening to-night he avoided st peter's in which his father had seats and went to the more remote church of fordington where he had a pew all to himself on this frosty winter night except for one well-behaved worshipper in the person of his father's old and confidential clerk james hayfield a constant church-goer who was punctual at every evening service whatever the weather harrington had expected to see him there hayfield sat modestly aloof at the further end of that pew but when the service was over the young man took some pains to follow close upon the heels of the grey-haired clerk with shoulders bent by long years of desk-work and respectable dark blue chesterfield overcoat with velvet collar how do you do hayfield isn't this rather a sharp night for you to venture out in said harrington as they left the church porch i'm a toughish customer i thank you mr harrington it would take severer weather than this to keep me away from the evening service i'm very fond of the evening service a fine sermon sir a fine awakening sermon magnificent capital exclaimed harrington who hadn't heard two consecutive sentences and whose mind had been engaged upon arithmetical problems of the most unpleasant kind it is uncommonly cold though he added shivering i'll walk round your way it will be a little longer for me you're very good mr harrington very good indeed said the old clerk evidently touched by this unusual condescension never till to-night had his master's son offered to walk home from church with him the old man's gratitude was more than harrington could stand he could not take credit for kindly condescension when he knew himself intent upon his own selfish ends i'm afraid i'm not altogether disinterested in seeking your company to-night hayfield he blurted out the fact is i want to ask a favour of you you may take it as granted mr harrington answered the clerk cheerily provided the granting of it lies within my power oh it's not a tremendous affair in point of fact it's only a small money matter i'm exceeding my allowance a little this quarter but i intend to pull up next quarter and it will be a great convenience to me in the meantime if you'll lend me ten or fifteen pounds it was out at last he had no idea until he uttered the words how mean a creature the utterance of them would make him seem to himself there are people who go through life borrowing and who do it with the easiest grace seeming to confer rather than to ask a favour but perhaps even with these gifted ones the first plunge was painful fifteen or twenty if you like sir replied hayfield i've got a few pounds in an old stocking and any little sum like that is freely at your service i know your father's son won't break his word or forget that an old servant's savings are his only bulwark against age and decay my dear hayfield of course i shall repay you next quarter without fail thank you mr harrington i feel sure you will and if at the same time i may venture a word as an old man to a young one in all friendliness and respect i would ask you to beware of horses i heard some one that dropped the other evening in the billiard-room at the antelope where i occasionally play a fifty i heard it said promiscuously that sir henry baldwin is a better hand at selling a horse than you are at buying one that's bosh hayfield and people in a god-forsaken town like dorchester will always talk bosh especially in a public billiard-room the horse is a good horse and i shall come home upon him when i send him up to tattersall's after the hunting i only hope he won't come home upon you sir you'd better not put a high reserve upon him if you don't want to see him again i used to be considered a pretty good judge of a horse in my time i never was an equestrian but one sees more of a horse from the pavement than when one is on his back harrington felt that he must bear with this twaddle for the sake of the twenty pounds which would enable him to lend juliet around fifty and would thereby enable juliet to go to medlow court and flirt with unknown men and forget him upon whom her impecuniosity was inflicting such humiliation after all love is only another name for a suffering mr hayfield lived in west walk terrace where he had a neat first floor in a stucco villa semi-detached and built at a period when villas strove to be architectural without attaining beauty 
the first floor consisted of a front sitting-room looking out upon the alley of sycamores and the green beyond and a back bedroom looking over gardens and houses towards the church tower in the heart of the town provided with a latch-key mr hayfield admitted his master's son to the inner mysteries of the villa where a lady with a very reedy voice was singing far away in the front parlour while a family conversation which almost drowned her melody was going on in the back parlour mr hayfield's bedroom candlestick and matches were ready for him on a swiss bracket near his door and his lamp was ready on a table in his sitting-room where every object was disposed with a studied precision which marked at once the confirmed bachelor and the model lodger the pilgrim's progress the christian year whitaker's almanac and uncle tom's cabin were placed with mathematical regularity upon the walnut loo table surrounding a centrepiece of wax flowers in an alabaster vase under a glass shade a smaller table of the nature described as pembroke was placed nearer the fire and on this appeared mr hayfield's supper tray set forth with a plate of cold roast beef a glass saucer of oriental pickle cheese and accompaniments flanked by an imperial pint of guinness a small fire burnt brightly in the grate whose dimensions had been reduced by a careful adjustment of fire-bricks sit down my dear mr harrington you'll find that chair very comfortable i'll go and get out the money my cash-box is in the next room can i tempt you to join me in a plate of cold ribs there's plenty more where that came from mrs potter has a fine wing rib every sunday from year's end to year's end i generally take my dinner with her and her family but i sup alone a little society goes a long way with a man of my age i like my lloyd and my news of the world after supper he went into his bedroom which was approached by folding doors and came back again in two minutes with a couple of crisp notes the savings of half a year savings which meant a good deal of self-denial in a man who in his own words wished to live like a gentleman the old clerk prided himself upon his good broadcloth clean linen and respectable lodgings and it was felt in town that so respectable a servant enhanced even the respectability of dalbrook and son harrington took the bank notes with many thanks and insisted upon writing a note of hand albeit the old clerk reminded him that sunday was a diaz non at the desk where hayfield wrote his letters and did any copying work he cared to do after office hours he stayed while the old man ate his temperate meal but would not be persuaded to share it indeed his lips felt hot and dry and it seemed to him as if he should never want to eat again but he gladly accepted a tumbler of the refreshing guinness upon the repeated assurance that there was plenty more where that came from there was a rapid thaw on the following morning so harrington rode the black over to the mount in the twilight after office hours a liberty which that high-bred animal resented by taking fright at every doubtful object in a long leafless avenue beyond the roman amphitheatre trifles which would have been light as air to him jogging homeward in company after a long day's hunting assumed awful and ghostly aspects under the combined influences of solitude and want of work the twilight ride to the mount was in fact a series of hair-breadth escapes and it would have needed a stronger stimulant than the dowager's wishy-washy tea to restore mr dalbrook's physical balance if his mental balance had not been so thoroughly unhinged as to make him half unconscious of physical discomfort you look awfully seedy said juliet as she poured out tea from a pot that had been standing nearly half an hour the dowager had retired to her own den where she occupied a great portion of her life in writing prosy letters to her relatives and connections of all degrees but as she never sent them anything else this was her only way of maintaining the glow of family feeling the black nearly pulled my fingers off replied harrington i never knew him so fresh you should have taken him out on the downs answered juliet rather contemptuously the grass is all right after the thaw have you brought me what you so kindly promised he took a sealed envelope out of his breast pocket and handed it to her is this the fifty how quite too good of you she cried pocketing it hastily you don't know what a difficulty you have got me out of but i'm afraid i may have inconvenienced you this was evidently an afterthought being your slave what should i do but tend upon the hours and times of your desire quoted harrington with a sentimental air how sweet exclaimed juliet really touched by his affection yet she would rather he had told her that fifty pounds was a sum of no consequence and that so small a loan involved no inconvenience for him i'm afraid his father can hardly be as rich as people think she said to herself while harrington relaxed his strained muscles before the fire 
how i wish you were not going to medlow he said presently so do i but i can't possibly get out of it and then it's a blessed escape to get away from here do you really dislike your home asked her lover wondering at this hitherto unknown characteristic in a young woman i loathe it and so does my sister though she pretends to be domestic and religious and all that kind of thing lady baldwin is an impossible person and our housekeeping would disgrace the union if i had not had the entree of plenty of good houses and been in request i should have been found hanging in one of the attics years ago this candour gave harrington an uncomfortably chilly feeling as if a damp cold wind had blown over him and then he told himself that it would be his privilege to initiate this dear girl in the tranquil delights of a happy home which while modest in its pretensions should yet be smart enough to satisfy her superior tastes and aspirations when do you go he asked preparing to take leave to-morrow your kindness has made everything easy to me come back as soon as you can love and then there was some lingering foolishness permissible between engaged lovers and the beautiful miss baldwin's head reposed for two or three minutes upon the articled clerk's shoulder while he looked into her eyes and told her that they were stars to light him on to fame and fortune i hope they'll show you a short cut she said he left her cheered by the thought that she was very fond of him and so she was but he was not the first second third or fourth young man of whom she had been fond nor was it a new thing to her to be told that her eyes were guiding stars end of chapter eighteen end of volume one of the day will come by mary elizabeth braddon recorded by celine major